Hey, good morning, church. Uh, we are so excited to be here uh, together this morning. So let's stand up and praise our God. And let's just sing him. Let's sing out to him.
Well, this morning, I wanted to dismiss our youth to go on to the youth service. And as they do so, I want to read to you a scripture passage. It comes from John 3, 16 and 17. We all should know this. It says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And you know, this is our Jesus, this is our Lord. This is our Lord and Savior before he came with one purpose, with one thing in mind, and that is to save us through his sacrifice on the cross. And so this morning we want to praise him, we want to worship him because the message of Jesus is hope and triumph. A reminder that in the darkest of times, there is hope for a better tomorrow. You know, this week we just celebrated Good Friday, and Friday was good. And Sunday is coming, and Sunday is here now. It is here now. So let us praise and worship our God, our Jesus together, for all that he has done for us as we sing together. light dawns in God some say madmen some say the working Jesus Christ the Nazareth he knew well what all from sin a perfect man would have to die only he could pay the Friday's good cause Sunday's coming don't lose hope cause Sunday's coming You're done, you better stop running Friday's good cause Sunday's coming So let those soldiers take it in As his friend betrayed him with us And before the Like a lamb to the slaughter didn't make a sound And he carried that cross to Calvary And he shed his blood to set us free As the nails went in and the sky went dark The redemption of the world
watching wave Like a bride for a groom Oh, church, rise He's coming soon He's alive He's alive He's alive He's alive Would you sing that? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, little wet Resurrection Sunday this morning. Um, welcome to North Orange. My name is Brian. I'm one of the elders here. So whether you're here in person or online, uh, we're so happy that you've joined us today uh, for this Easter Sunday. So would you join me in prayer as we come before the Lord? Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for this day and the weather as the sun is starting to break through the storm, um, but the rain just reminds us that it's spring, um, that there's new life, that everything is being, uh, there's a sense of birth and um, cleanliness, Lord, from all of this, and it so represents what today is all about, that it is uh, the day we celebrate your resurrection, the day that we celebrate um, the ability for us to have eternal life and have that relationship with you um, because you rose from the dead. And so we celebrate that day, Lord. We celebrate what it means to have a new life in you. And so we um, ask that during this time, you would help us to uh, just prepare our hearts and our minds to receive your word, to um, praise you back, Lord, to um, use the time as we either celebrate this day with family or friends or to reflect on it um, that it is all about you, Lord, and this is the reason why we celebrate today in that resurrection, Lord. I know that in the midst of all of this, there's still hurt going on, there's trials and tribulations that we're going through, Lord, and so I pray that for, um, if any of us are kind of going through something right now, that you would uh, be with us, Lord God, be with those that are hurting, be with those that are going through trials, Lord God, that you would watch over them, Lord. We know that this world is in turmoil as well, Lord. We pray for continued peace, um, not only in our in our world, Lord, but even in our city here, Lord, and, and just locally. Lord, thank you so much for Edmund and the staff, Lord, and all those that are behind the scenes to help us into this moment to be able to um, worship you, Lord, to help prepare us to, um, as we prepare for communion, as we prepare for um, being able to um, be part of this worship experience, Lord, that um, you would be with him through his words and through us as we pray to you, worship you, and partake in communion together. We ask that you be with us in your name. Amen. So uh, last night, uh, after all the sports was on, I noticed that the Ten Commandments were on TV last night. I'm like, oh, that's kind of, you know, old school. I only watched like five minutes of it, and then I went to look for more sports. But basically, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments and the whole idea of Exodus is all like almost a prequel of what Easter is all about. The whole idea of God's chosen people being delivered, needing to sacrifice the lamb, right, for the Passover, for blood, so that the angel of death would pass over. 
the whole idea of just, yeah, that idea of being saved and delivered um, out of slavery or out of um, you know, penalty like that. Um, that was all a prequel to what Jesus did. And so this past week, as we've kind of celebrated the Easter week, the Holy Week with um, you know, Passover being kind of celebrated in Jesus' time, he instituted the idea of communion. He kind of fulfilled the next step of it, that it wasn't about a physical deliverance, that it wasn't about um, something that it was going to be um, a deliverance from what it was going on then. It was a spiritual deliverance. It was a spiritual freedom that we would be freed from. And using this, the same symbols, right, the same idea of blood and sacrifice and God watching over his people. This is what communion is all about. This is what this time is all about. And so if you've given your life to Jesus, um, if this is your first time here or you've been here for many years, um, here in North Orange, we basically practice an open communion, meaning that um, anyone who's given their life to Jesus can partake in this moment to be able to um, reflect on what Jesus' death and resurrection means to us. So we have two stations here at the front, one in the back here. We'll have a little bit of time of music where everyone can go up and uh, grab one of the elements, sit back at your seat, and just kind of reflect on what this Resurrection Sunday means to you. If uh, this is your first time, or this is your first time hearing what it means to um, learn about Jesus, I really encourage you to stay the next couple Sundays and come and learn what Jesus is all about. Come talk to one of us and we'd be happy to share. But this is our time to be able to really reflect and uh, worship the Lord and praise him through um, taking communion together. So just as we kind of remembered uh, Good Friday and the idea of death on a cross and taking communion on Friday was a lot more somber, it's a lot more pensive about just what it means to go to the cross to die for us. But Sunday here, it's all about celebration. It's about these elements helping to remind us that we have new life in Christ and that we should celebrate that. It's not an image of death or um, suffering, it's an image and a memory of what it means to have new life here. And so um, the cracker represents Christ's body that was broken for us. And the juice representing nothing but the blood of Jesus to save us from our sins. Would you pray with me?
Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for loving us and going to the cross to die for our sins. But in all of that, conquering death so that on this day we can actually remember what it means to have new life in you, that we can be renewed, that all of the things that we've done, all the things that we're doing, all the evil things that we will do, Lord, are all washed away and made clean in you. And so we thank you so much for that. We thank you for that opportunity to have new life through you. And Lord, as we continue our worship service this time, Lord, um, may our tithes and offerings and things that we give back to you, Lord, um, be a blessing to you, Lord. We know that in all things, we don't need any. You, we don't deserve anything, Lord, but you graciously give us so many blessings in this life so that giving back is just an action and a portion of all that you've done to us. In your name I pray, amen. So as, again, part of our worship service, um, it is just a reminder that we do have a time for tithes and offerings. And so um, if the Lord has blessed you or you're prepared to give back to the Lord, it's not about how much you give or what you give, but it's that symbolic act of being able to give back to the Lord what he's given us. So we have two baskets here in the front, one uh, box in the back lobby. You can give any time throughout the service or during the week or online to the office. Um, this is just an opportunity for us to continue our worship and thankful and praise to God for all that he's given us. Good morning, my name is Edmund Brooks. I'm the lead pastor here at North Orange Christian Church. I basically lead the church here. Good morning, everybody. My name is Stephen Ulanka, and I'm the pastor of Worship Arts, and I handle everything that happens in the worship service. Hi, my name is Callie Coe, and I'm the director of children's ministries here at North Orange Christian Church, and I oversee all the programs for infants through sixth graders. Hi, I'm Mariah Tucker, and I'm the director of youth and young adults. That means I oversee programs from seventh graders all the way to young adults. Hi, I'm David Doherty. I'm the office and facilities manager here at North Orange. I oversee everything that happens on campus. I gotta go with Reese's, peanut butter and chocolate. Can't beat it. I'd have to say Reese's. If I had to choose, Reese's. Neither, I like Starburst jelly beans. Reese's. I'm gonna go with Peeps. I know it's controversial, but they're so good. Chocolate bunnies, I'm a chocolate guy. Definitely Peeps. Chocolate bunny. Peeps. I'm going to go with none of those San Francisco Giants, Bay Area kid. We suffer together. <laughs> I would have to say Angels or Dodgers. I don't know. Is that even a question? Dodgers. Angels all the way. Seattle Mariners. I'm going to go Disneyland. Kids like Disneyland. I like Disneyland. It's kind of expensive, though. Disneyland all the way. Absolutely Disneyland. Of course it has to be not. Disneyland. Thanks for joining us for our Easter service here at North Orange. If you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to come check us out for a few weeks. See if this is a good fit for you. Hey, God is up to something here at North Orange, and we think that you might be a part of it. So check us out and have a great Easter. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Stephen, if we haven't met before, and I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and I have a few announcements for us this morning. Number one, if you saw that we have name tags uh, available uh, so that you can fill out your name tags so that uh, during the greeting time, in a moment, we can greet each other by name. So if you didn't get one, please go to the lobby to get one of those. Also, as you came in, you might have saw our Easter photo booth. Please take advantage of that. And if you are gonna post that on social, go ahead and tag us on North Orange. We love to see all of those pictures, so please go ahead and do that as well. Now, I do want to point out our website or our app, NOCC.org, or check out that QR code for our bulletin for any more information about our church. If you're visiting with us, we are so happy that you're visiting with us on Easter, and we have a gift for you. Um, go to our welcome table, which is around the corner over here. 
uh, because of our rain setup. And we'd love to hand you a gift and answer any questions you have about the church. So hopefully you give us the opportunity to do that. Also, we want everybody to fill out our Connect card. Uh, fill out uh, any information that you need from us. And also fill out our prayer requests. We'd love to take this week and pray for you and follow up on those prayer requests. So please give us the opportunity to do that. But right now, everybody, let's go ahead and stand together. Let us greet each other, everyone. And let us find somebody that we don't know. And let us wish each other a happy Easter. Let's do that right now. The older we get, the more we look back on our lives and wish we would have done things differently. Our choices not only haunt us, but at times they can travel with us. Words like shame and guilt attach themselves to the stories our lives are telling. Peter, a follower of Christ, knew this all too well. He was the disciple who dropped everything to follow Jesus, was an eyewitness to miracles that we only dream of experiencing, and was the only disciple to step out of the boat and walk on water, even if only for a few seconds. But then things get messy. The pressure of the crowd causes Peter to experience his own version of shame and guilt. And if we're honest, our lives might just be closer to Peter's life than we care to admit. You're invited into a moment of reset and discovery because the events around the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus are the absolute answer to every longing heart. So may God give us eyes to see. Good morning. Happy Easter to you. It's my honor to have you join us this morning for our Easter service to, res to celebrate a resurrected Messiah. And if you're joining us here in person or here online, we welcome you. Easter's a really cool holiday. Um, it is the most important holiday for us in the church, for us who call ourselves Christians. And yet, there's a lot of stuff that surrounds it. So if I had to ask, like, why is Easter so special, we might have to narrow that down a bit. For instance, about six years ago, we lived in a house. We rented a house. It was in an older established neighborhood. It was close to Old Town Orange. And we moved in maybe a week before Easter. This was about six years ago. And um, I'm leaving at about 5.30 in the morning, Easter morning, to head here for sunrise service. Give it up for sunrise service. Who's here at sunrise? All right. We're almost done, guys. Almost done. So I leave at 5.30 in the morning. As I step out of my new house, on the steps leading down, in and out, is like, like, it looks like spray paint. It looks like white spray paint on the ground. And I thought, somebody vandalized our house. Like we're a new family, right? Right? Like they must not like us here, you know? And as I look closer, each one of these little white spray painted things is in the shape of a hoof, like a bunny hoof. So what had happened was somebody in that neighborhood who knew we had kids had gotten up really early, because this is 5.30 in the morning, gotten up really early 
and put out these hoof prints coming in and out of the house so that the kids would think the Easter Bunny came. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? My kids totally didn't get it. We never really did the Easter Bunny, but I thought it was cool. It's good. And this person had done it for every house on the block that had children. That's cool, right? That's a cool thing to do. That's a cool tradition. For you guys, some of you guys are going to celebrate some traditions today. You'll do some egg hunts. Like kids are going to find some eggs. You'll, you'll celebrate with family. Some ham involved, right? Right? So there's some really cool things about Easter. We talked about them. Um, chocolate bunnies, all that stuff. But when we narrow it down to what Easter is really about, we, we say resurrection, Right? But even that, if we zoomed in a little more on the importance of that, I think we could really get something that's a good answer to what Easter is all about. And this morning, I'd like to do that by kind of taking you through a biography of one of the apostles, the most important apostle, apart from Paul, the most important apostle that followed Jesus at the time. His name was Peter. So if you'd allow me, I'd like to take you to an answer of what Easter is all about through the life of Peter. The first thing where we get introduced to Peter is the fact that his brother Andrew has found the Messiah. He has found the Messiah. So I'm in John 1. I'll have all these scriptures up here for you because I'm going to be moving fast for this biography. And so Andrew, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looks at him. This is Peter. Simon at the time, and he says, you are Simon, the son of John, sometimes called Jonah. And he says, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So on the spot, Jesus acknowledges Peter, gives him a, ch- a name change, right? But do you remember when you first heard about Jesus? Some of you, it's going to be today. Put your seatbelt on, it's going to be good, right? But did somebody come to you with the idea of Jesus, like, like a gospel message of Jesus, and said, here he is, the answer to all the yearnings, all the hurts, everything that you've been looking for to make your life complete. And that's what Andrew presented to his brother, Simon, who's now called Peter, and he says, this is the Messiah. We found the one who's going to make all things right. Right then, Jesus called Andrew and Peter to be among his disciples. So at the, at the time of Jesus, it was not uncommon for a prophet to come into town. And this prophet would select people to follow him for a semester abroad, so to speak, right? You were going to follow the prophet. You were going to eat with him. You were going to live with him. He was going to teach you the things of God. And so, Peter cho- um, so Jesus chose 12, and Peter was one of the 12 that was chosen. And through this, quote, semester abroad, through Peter learning from Jesus, there were a lot of things that Peter saw. Peter saw how Jesus, shortly after calling all these disciples, goes to a little hill on Galilee and preaches the most famous sermon ever preached. In this sermon, he explains the commandments He explains what it means to be a neighbor. He explains what it means to follow God entirely with your whole heart. He basically unlocks the secrets of God for a small crowd. We call that the Sermon on the Mount. Another time, he was taking a nap in a boat, and a storm rose up. And Jesus woke up and told the storm, hey, stop. You know what happened? It stopped. That was a miracle. Everybody said, what is with this guy? And Jesus went back to sleep, by the way, right? They said, what is with this guy? Even the wind and waves listened to him. Sometimes he would walk into cities and demon-oppressed, demon-possessed people would come and fall at his feet. And the demons would speak to Jesus through the person, Jesus, please don't torture us. And the apostle said, this is a powerful guy. Even fallen angels are begging not to be tortured. And Jesus would say, get out of this person. And the demon had to flee. So so Jesus is casting out demons. There was this other time where someone who'd never walked before, Jesus healed 
a spine that didn't work before, and that person walked. There was another time someone's eyes had never seen before. Jesus spits in the mud, rubs it on their eyes, and now they can see again. There's a time when a woman was bleeding for years. Jesus heals her. He healed all these diseases. Another time, there was a girl who was dead. And as Jesus walks up to the funeral, they say, don't bother. She's dead. This is the ancient Near East. They know what dead is. Their lifespan back then was 35 years old. They saw the life leave her young body. They know what it looked like when the fever turned cold. And they said, don't bother. She's dead. And Jesus went in there and said, get up, little girl. She got up. She said, I'm hungry. Jesus said, mom, make her something to eat. Jesus raised the dead. And so Peter sees all of this. Like this is something that he sees firsthand as one of the apostles. One time, he, Jesus had preached a message. There were thousands. We're talking mega church, right? They were listening to him on this hill. And sometimes the preacher can go long, right? But unlike me, Jesus is allowed to go long, right? And so when Jesus started going into supper time, the disciples said, hey, we gotta feed these people. There's thousands of them. And Jesus said, what do we got? And they grabbed this little boy. They took his sack lunch. Really? It's a form of bullying. No, I'm just kidding. They took, what did he have? A Lunchable. Five fishes. Two loaves of bread. Maybe he was sharing it with a sister or something. And Jesus said, you know what? This will do. And he fed 5,000 people with the little lunch, lunch box that that kid brought. After all that, after all that, Jesus said, you know what? I'm tired. I'm gonna go spend some time with the Father alone. You guys, go ahead and go, go ahead of me. You cross the Sea of Galilee to the other side and I'll meet up with you. And they said, okay. And so they're crossing the sea in their boat. Hours later, in the middle of the night, and they see this shadowy figure starting to come towards them. They were scared. Read the text. It says, they thought it was a ghost, and they became terrified. But as this figure came closer and closer, they realized he looked familiar. It was just Jesus strolling by. He was going to meet them on the other side, just walking on water, you know? to meet them on the other side, probably racing them, right? And Peter, Matthew 14, said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. Peter, our guy, we're following him. A little bit of impulse here, right? But a lot of like eagerness. If this is you, I wanna be with you. But in order to do that, he's gonna have to walk on water too. And Jesus said, come, come on. So Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking towards Jesus, right? Which is a miracle, because you're not supposed to walk on water, right? But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. So at some point, he goes, I'm walking on water. That's not supposed to happen. He starts to sink. Jesus grabs him. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took it, and said, you a little faith, why'd you doubt And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Have you ever been a part of something cool for Jesus? Ministry is basically all I've done my entire life, with teenagers and now leading this church. So there were times I've led entire um, winter camps, led all the program, taught all of it. Um, There's times I've led kids to Christ. I've I've done the volleyball ministry over the summer. I've been a part of some cool stuff here. Nothing compared to what Peter's been involved with, right? He was walking on water. Let me ask you a question. How many other disciples got out of the boat? Just him. It took courage. And it took faith. Now that faith dropped a little bit, but it took faith to get out of the boat, right? 
Peter right now is distinguishing himself as a leader of the apostles. He's setting himself apart. As the ministry progressed, people are amazed at Jesus. Jesus knows this. He continues to preach. He continues to heal. And, and the Hebrew people had a long history of prophets who came before them. And so they're saying, this Jesus, he's, he's got to be Elijah. Like, this Jesus, he's got to be Moses. Like, this Jesus, he's got to be. And they're comparing him to all these other prophets. They're saying he is them. And Jesus knows that the people are doing this. And he, he gathers his disciples and he says, who do you guys say that I am? And he wasn't asking for their opinion. All right? You could today go to a sports bar, go to the Buffalo Wild Wings, go to the Chili's. You could go there and you could start a discussion among the sports bar and people will give their opinions. Is LeBron better than Jordan, right? And people will chime in with their opinions, right? Right? He's not, okay? But... But you get all these opinions from people, correct? That's not what Jesus is asking here. He's not saying, I want your opinion. He's saying, who do you say that I am? Am I the Messiah? And the answer to that question is everything every one of us must answer. Because that answer to that question determines our faith. And here's Peter's response. Verse 15, Matthew 16. He said to them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, which means son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Have you ever gotten an answer correct in class? Right? Feel good about that? This is the ultimate attaboy, right? Peter's ahead of the class now. Peter finds, he, he, he answers him correctly and says, you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, you are the foundation and I will build my church on you and the gates of hell won't stop what we're doing. Peter's gotta be going, awesome, right? At this point, Peter is the leader of the apostles because Jesus has acknowledged him as such. So Peter is now leading this group and everything's going according to plan. And then, then comes what we've been building up towards. There's what they call the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus is welcomed as a Messiah right in the back of a donkey. And they're throwing their cloaks out for him. And they're putting palm leaves down for him. And they're saying, Hosanna, which means save us. And they recognize him as a Messiah. But not the Messiah. See, what they wanted from Jesus, they wanted him to be a political leader. A political leader that would free them from the oppression of Rome. And when he wasn't who they wanted him to be, they turned on him. Make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, there are people this day who are claiming Jesus because they want something political from him. And when he doesn't do things their way, they will turn on him. Whole other sermon. I just opened the can of worms. There, argue about that at Easter. So he's at the, um, the Passover dinner. He's just been welcomed as a prophet. And he gets up from the dinner, ties a towel around his waist, and he decides to do the work of a servant. You know, if the prince or the president or a king went to your house and they started to vacuum, or they started doing the dishes, or if you've got a cat, they cleaned out the litter box, or maybe like cleaned up after the dog, what would you say? No, 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 don't do that. I will do that, right? I will do that. John 13, five, he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. This is so significant. Think about it. 
They had closed-toed shoes, right? So their feet were dirty and dusty, correct? Think about it. Roads that were not paved. So there's dirt involved, right? Think about this. How many animal-drawn carriages were there, right? And was there uh, poop bags along the way for you to clean up after your pet? No. Their feet were disgusting. And Jesus goes to serve and wash their feet clean. But Peter, when he came to Simon Peter, he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? That's not what you do. I'm your servant. You're the master. You cannot wash my feet. Don't do the dishes. Don't clean up after the cat. That's servant work, right? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing, you do not understand now. Duh, right? But afterward, you will understand. Peter answered him, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. It's kind of a, kind of a polite thing to say. You're the Lord. I'm under you. Jesus answered, if I don't wash you, you will have no share with me. You'll not be my disciple. You won't have the blessings and abundant life that come in this life and the promise of heaven after. Then Jesus, uh, then Peter goes, okay, wash my feet. But don't stop there, wash my hands. Let's take a shower. Like, I want all the blessings, right? That's what Peter says. Servants don't do that, okay? But Peter said, I am eager. I want everything that you have for me, God. If washing feet is 100% sold out, I want 110%. Wash my head and wash my hands. Jesus said, Peter, calm down, all right? You're clean. I, I need to wash all of your feet to show you that I'm, I'm gonna serve, and you're called to serve. What we see here is Peter's impulsivity again, but desire. He is sold out in the faith. If this is what it takes, I'm all in. Give me everything that God has to offer. Peter is a lead disciple who really wants the things of God. Is that good? Things are great for the apostle Peter. Later that same long night, things took a somber turn as Jesus starts talking about his own death, his death for the sins of the world. And, and the disciples don't really understand it. If somebody was in your presence, they were teaching you, you were learning from their life, and they said, I'm going to die, you would try to protect them, correct? John 13, Simon said, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow after her. No, 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 Lord. Some of you have said that. No, Lord, says Peter. Why can I not follow you now? I'll go where you're going now. I'll die for it. I will lay down my life for you. All these other 11 losers, apostles, right? They're nothing compared to me. I'm in this till the end. Peter says, I'm so down for the cause, I'll die for you. But Jesus did something that he does to us often. He calls Peter on it. In verse 38, Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me, really? Really, seriously, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you've denied me three times. When the morning comes, when the roosters wake us up as part of God's natural alarm clock, you, Mr. Die for me, follow me to the end, will deny me three times. Now, how must Peter have felt right then and there? You're riding high. You're the lead apostle. You're, 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 you're the one who got out of the boat. You've done miracles in the name of Jesus. And Jesus says, you know what? By the time that the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Has anyone ever told you something about yourself that you did not know? Like you woke up in the morning and your spouse goes, wow, you snore. Like, I didn't know, I was asleep, right? Or, or, or your doctor walks into the exam room and goes, hey, the tests came back. You have high blood pressure. And you go, wow, didn't know that, right? Sometimes people tell you things about yourself you did not know, right? And right now, Jesus tells Peter, you think that you will follow me till the end, but the truth is you will abandon and you will deny me. How does that feel? He's gotta be wrong. He's gotta be wrong. I mean, 
he did raise the dead and he casts out demons and he walks on water, but he doesn't know me. The cool thing about what Jesus said was it was in the future, right? Like it hasn't happened yet. So Peter's gotta be thinking, if he says I'm gonna do this, you know what I'm not gonna do? I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna take every step to not betray, not to deny him. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna start packing heat. And so he brings a sword with them everywhere. That's the equivalent of you guys, your concealed carry to a prayer meeting, right? That's you guys bringing your AR-15s, right? And that's like a big deal here in, in, in California, right? If you're, from, if you're watching this in Texas, it's nothing, right? That's a Tuesday, okay? But here in California, that's like bringing a tank with you, okay? And so he starts packing this sword everywhere he goes. He goes, I'm gonna show him. I won't betray him. It has not happened. I'm into the end. Then Jesus goes to a garden to pray. This is a really long night, guys. This is middle of the night, two in the morning stuff now. And he says, hey guys, I know you guys are all food coma -y, right? We just had a Passover dinner, but I need you to do something for me. Jesus says, I'm gonna go have the most intense prayer that's ever happened. I'm gonna go talk to the Father about this very important mission. All I need from you guys is to stay here, watch, and pray. Sounds simple enough, right? But he comes back, and they're asleep. And he says, guys, wake up. I need you guys to stay awake and pray. So they try again. Three times total. This happens. And on the third time, there's a mob ready to arrest Jesus. Now you'd think that arresting a prophet and his disciples would be easy, right? They will come easy. They're people of peace. No big deal. And so they come to arrest Jesus and this is what happens, Matthew 26, 5. Behold, one of those who was with Jesus, this is Peter, stretched out his hand, drew his sword, struck the servant, the one who grabbed Jesus, of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Was Peter aiming for an ear? Nobody tries to cut off an ear unless they're Vincent Van Gogh, okay? He was trying to take his head off his shoulders, right? Right? The problem is he's a fisherman, not a swordsman, so he's bad at this, okay? He said, I'm gonna deny you, I'm in this till the end, and he tried to kill the dude, right? Jesus, poured, Jesus took that dude's ear, put it back on his head, right? And, and he says this, Jesus said to him, put your sword back, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Peter, don't help, all right? I got this. And if I needed to, the Father in heaven would send armies of angels who know how to use swords, okay? Now things have changed a bit. He went from lead disciple walking on water to being admonished, I don't know, attempted manslaughter, right? This is bad, correct? So we see our guy Peter, he's changing in the midst of this, but you know what he didn't do? He didn't quit. Matter of fact, he went the other way. I'll kill a dude for you, Jesus, right? Then they arrested him. Matthew 26, 57. Those who see, seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders had gathered. This is a fake trial, one of many fake trials. And Peter, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna abandon him, was following, but at, his, as a, at a distance, you know, like, like a tail, right? Like a police tail. Like, I'm not gonna let him know I'm here but I got my sword, I'm ready, right? As far as the courtyard of the high priest and going inside, he sat with the guards to see how this would end. So Peter's kind of watching at a distance. But things start crumbling around him because he's safe right now. But let's see what happens. Peter's sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you were with Jesus the Galilean. And she's not just saying, hey, I recognize you. She's saying, hey, Put this guy on trial too. Like kill this dude, right? He's one of the followers. And so Jesus, um, so Peter says to the girl, hey, kid, shut up. 
right? Go away, right? I am not one of the followers. Verse 70, I do not know what you mean. And he went out to the entrance, so he's walking away, trying to get away from the crowd. He's got to save himself now. He's in danger. Another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. I swear to you. I promise. Never seen him. After, after a little while, the bystanders came up. The beating's been going for a while. The trial's been going for a while. And they said to Peter, certainly you are the one who, uh, you are one of them because your accent betrays you. You know what? You sound like you're from Galilee. You sound like one of them. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. Like, what else do I have to tell you? And immediately... He hears a rooster crow, and he remembers what Jesus said. And he is broken. The accounts say he wept bitterly. When Jesus needed him most, his number one guy, his first in command, his best friend, abandoned him. And Peter was alone. Peter denied Jesus when Jesus needed him the most. And I'm gonna ask you a question this morning. Have you ever betrayed someone? Have you ever betrayed someone in a way you didn't believe was possible? Like if you went into the past and you told yourself five years, five years in the past, you said, hey, there's gonna be a time in the next five years where you're gonna act so heinous that person would go, there's no way, no way. Have any of you ever taken an oath? Have any of you said, I'll, I'll never betray you, I'll never leave you, but you broke that oath? If you have, then you understand the tears that are flooding the face of Peter, our apostle. He has sinned against the Messiah in one of the most heinous ways he denied him. Where does he go from here? He was the number one disciple. He was the head of the class, and now he is on his own, abandoning the faith that he knew. Have you ever fallen further than you thought you could fall? Like you thought the floor was the limit, and you found out there's no floor, and you act that out in a way you never thought was possible. That's where Peter is. And then Peter watches with tears in his eyes as Jesus dies slow and humiliated on a cross. And the death of Jesus means that Peter doesn't get to make things right. So he dies and Peter dies in his betrayal. He will never be made right. Jesus dies and they bury him in a tomb. And in the morning we celebrate. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb to anoint his body. The body would have smelled after that. So there's time to anoint him with oils and perfumes. They roll the stone back. Jesus is gone. In fact, an angel tells Mary, Jesus is alive. Peter runs to the hole, the cave, and says, He's not here, he's alive. You know what we should do now? Let's go fishing. So him and a bunch of apostles go fishing. I tell you what, if you want to celebrate the Easter by fishing, it's biblical. Read it. <laughs> so Peter and a bunch, a bunch of apostles go back to what they know best. They're fishing. They haven't caught anything all day. And somebody on the shore, some guy, some old fisherman guy, Peg leg, one eye, I don't know, right? He goes, hey, throw your net on the other side. It's always some guy. He says, this is where the fish are. You go, guy, come on. You don't think I've tried that? Right? So they go, okay, we'll just throw it on the other side. And they throw their net on the other side. And what they pull up is an abundance of fish that they didn't know was possible. 
Peter makes the connection. He knows a miracle when he's seen one. He's seen enough of them. He jumps in the water, swims to shore, embraces Jesus. You're alive. And you know what they have together? Easter breakfast. Fish and bread. Barbecue, hibachi, right? So they have this fish breakfast, but there is a, there's an elephant in the room, right? Jesus is alive, but there's an elephant in the room. The last thing that Peter had done was betray the Messiah. And so Jesus seeks out the sinner, Peter, to make things right. Jesus sought the sinner and he says this, do you love me, Peter? He's like, of course I love you, you're alive. I've always loved you, you're back. And Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. And he said to him a second time, do you love me? He's like, yeah, Jesus, I love you. And Jesus responds to that, feed my sheep. And as he says that the second time, Peter realizes he's not asking about love, and Jesus isn't talking about livestock. He's asking, do you want to be restored? Like, am I the most important thing in your life? You've denied me. Do you want to be restored? And, and Peter's saying, yeah, that's what I want. And Jesus says, I will restore you to the lead of the apostles. I'll build my church on you again. Tend to my followers. And he asks him a third time, which matches the number of times that Peter sinned against him. Don't miss that. Do you love me? And at this point, Peter is weeping. Yes, I want to be restored. I repent. I'm sorry. I didn't know I could fall that far. And if you're offering me another chance, Jesus, I will take it. And the resurrected Jesus, holes in his hands, a hole in his side, says to Peter, feed my sheep. You are restored. What you thought was lost is restored. Because this is the truth of Easter. Jesus restored Peter. Jesus redeemed Peter. Because the resurrected Jesus can forgive every one of your sins. If Jesus remains in the tomb, Peter remains the disciple who betrayed. But a resurrected Messiah fulfilling all the prophecies means that there's an opportunity for restoration and redemption. What do I mean for redemption? I mean that if you've sinned, your sins are not counted against you. You've been redeemed. That means if you're a Christian and you've fallen, if you were following Jesus and you've sinned, you've rebelled, you can be restored. My question is for you watching online, for you sitting in here, have you betrayed Jesus? Have you fallen further than you thought you could ever fall? Here's an Easter truth. He can redeem you. The message of Easter is that through the resurrection of Jesus, you can be restored. The message of Easter is that through the resurrection of Jesus, you can be redeemed. Maybe it's your, your shame. Your shame sitting on, on your shoulder and it's whispering in your ear. And your shame is saying, I could never come to Jesus. I'm too bad. The things that I've done are too much. There's no way he would ever accept me. Maybe it's, it's the enemy. Maybe it's the devil, and he's whispering in your ear, and he's accusing you, and he's reminding you of every way that you've ever fallen. I want to show you those are lies from the pit of hell, because Jesus seeks the sinner, and if he did it for Peter, he can do it for you. Some of you this morning, I got to believe in a group this big, he's doing it. He's asking you. Do you love me? All you have to do is respond. Redemption and restoration is available. We've all fallen like Peter, but Jesus offers restoration. So here's what you do. 
If you're a believer and you've sinned against Jesus and you've abandoned your faith, I'm done with this. Somebody dragged you to church today because they promised you lunch, right? Good for them, okay? But you've chosen your own way like Peter. Jesus is inviting you to come to his embrace today. He brings redemption and restoration to you if you will come. Second group of people. In a group this big, watching online, there's gotta be, there's gotta be some. If you've never heard, never trusted in Jesus, and you say, I'm too bad, I can't be redeemed, those are lies. It doesn't matter what you've ever done. The resurrected Jesus offers redemption today. That's what we celebrate through Easter. What's Easter really all about? Candy's good. Egg hunts are fun, family is great, but Easter is a resurrected Messiah offering redemption for those who seek it. Peter knew it, he experienced it right there on that beach. I pray that you know it, and I pray that you've experienced it as well. Let's pray. Lord God, as we've taken this journey Following the apostle, I pray. I pray that if there's anybody here who is listening to the lie that they're too bad, that redemption isn't available to them, I pray that your spirit would be louder than the lies and that you would call back your son or your daughter today. If there's anybody in here who has never trusted in you and they don't think you will accept them because everybody has cast them out, I pray you would remind them how on this beach with Peter, who abandoned you, you sought him. And in the same way, you seek them today. God, would you call your children to you? Call some new believers home this Easter. Lord, for us, may this be something we never forget. In Jesus' name, amen. us, for restoring us. All hail King Jesus. All hail the power of Jesus' name, for he is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he is the Savior of the world. Let us stand together and let's sing.
morning before we have our benediction. Today is actually our fifth Sunday, and that what calls for is a fifth Sunday benevolence offering. And this just helps us uh, help our community during the week. So if you do have loose bills, loose change, loose checks, uh, the host will be in the back uh, as you walk out with bags ready to collect those. But this morning, let us continue to stand for our benediction. I want to try the, uh, the Easter greeting to you. So I'm going to say, he is risen. I want you to shout back, he's risen indeed, all right? He has risen. He has risen indeed. All right. Sounds good. Why don't you guys close your eyes, open your hands. I want to give you an Easter blessing this morning. May you be the restored and redeemed people of God because the Messiah has risen from the grave. May you live as though your Jesus has been resurrected, not just on Easter, but every day from here on out. God bless you. Have a good week. Amen.